Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to our webinar on varicose veins treatment. My name is Vicky and I'll be your host this evening. Our expert presenter this evening is consultant vascular surgeon, Mr. Eddie Chaloner. This presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. If you'd like to ask a question during or after the presentation, please do so by using the Q&A icon, which is at the bottom of your screen. This can be done with or without giving your name. Please note that this session is being recorded if you do provide your name. If you'd like to book your consultation, we'll provide contact details at the end of this session. So I'll now hand over to Mr. Eddie Chaloner and you'll hear from me again shortly. Well, thank you very much, Vicky, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us this evening um, for this webinar. Um, yes, yeah, so that's a slightly younger picture of me. Uh, you'll see my hair hasn't grown back. Um, I'm just slightly fatter. And um, I'm a uh, consultant vascular surgeon um, working here at Benenden Hospital and also uh, in private practice closer to London. Um, my main interest is um, varicose vein surgery or more specifically, minimally invasive varicose vein surgery. And in this webinar, um, we're going to cover these topics. Um, my experience in, in this field uh, and the treatments available at Benenden. Uh, a general overview of what varicose veins are and what the treatment options are for this common condition. Uh, and then we're going to talk about how we assess varicose veins in clinic um, and what the uh, normal sort of expectation of, of results is after surgery. And then we'll have some time for a Q&A. So um, I uh, qualified in medicine um, a long time ago, 1989. So I'm now, I think, in my 30, 34th year of practice. Um, and uh, as some of you may know, it takes a long time um, to learn how to, uh, to, to do surgery. Uh, it takes about 12 years in training. And um, I was appointed my first consultant job was at UCH in London, uh, I think in 2002. And I'd just been appointed as a consultant uh, when this chap turned up with the latest piece of equipment from New York, uh, where you could, he said, you could do varicose veins with a laser under local anaesthetic. And prior to that, we, we used to do it by putting people to sleep, cutting them in the top of the leg and stripping the vein out. That was the standard operation for about 100 years. Um, and I looked at this kit and I thought, well, that's never going to work. But um, I'm a new consultant and I need a new thing. So we'll try it. Uh, and within six months, I knew it was going to completely change practice in this field, which indeed it did. Um, and now um, EVLT, which is the acronym for laser treatment uh, and various spin-off techniques, which are more or less the same thing, are now the gold standard for treatment of veins. And I'll say more about that later on. We do a lot of vein surgery here at Benenden. Um, we, according to it, there's, a, there's an organizational thing, the Private Healthcare Information Network, which, which looks at uh, audits all the um, operations that are done uh, in the UK. And we treat more patients per year uh, here in this hospital and in my practice with Mr. Sweeney than, than anywhere else in the UK. So that certainly doesn't make us perfect, but it does mean we have a lot of experience. Um, and that, generally speaking, is a good thing. Um, so treatment here at Benenden Hospital, the majority of um, vein operations we do here, we do under local anaesthetic, uh, which is a bit like going to the dentist. Uh, so we have injections of, of local anaesthetic into the leg with or without um, a pre prior sedative for patients who are, who are anxious about surgery. And uh, as I say, we've been doing this for a long time and we've done thousands and thousands of cases. Um, and most patients prefer 
to have surgery under local anaesthetic where possible. Sometimes it isn't possible, either because of the technical aspects require a general anaesthetic or because patients are very anxious about surgery, in which case we can give a general anaesthetic. Um, the operation is entirely the same. It's just that the patient is asleep rather than awake. So what are varicose veins? What's it all about? Well, the first of all, they're extraordinarily common. Around about a third of the population will get varicose veins at some point in their lives. They may not all be aware of it and they may not all require surgery, but it's an extremely common condition. In fact, uh, I recently noticed I have it myself on my left leg um, and I might touch on that a bit later on. So most patients notice that they've got varicose veins because they notice swollen and then large veins, usually on the lower part of the leg between the knee and the ankle. They can appear on the thigh, but, but more commonly it's in the lower part of the leg and they look blue or purple and stick out from the skin. Um, the symptoms that patients will commonly get with, with varicose veins are aching, heavy and uncomfortable legs with occasionally swelling of the feet uh, in the, in the um, evening when you've been on your, um, on your legs all day. Uh, and it seems to be worse at night. That, that's probably because patients aren't doing very much at night. And they tend to notice it. If the veins um, persist for a long time, they can start to damage the skin, usually in the lower part of the leg around the ankle. And um, some people get a condition called venous eczema, which is an irritation of the skin, uh, usually just around the ankle area. And that's quite a serious matter because once that starts, if it goes on for long enough, the skin can be damaged sufficiently to cause an ulcer, which I'll say more about in a little while. But as I was saying, the vast majority of uh, veins can be fixed uh, with a very uh, effective technique, uh, what we call minimally invasive. So uh, we don't have to make any big incisions in people um, and very few or almost no patients nowadays need to stay in hospital overnight. Uh, here at Benenden, we do well over 90% of our cases under local anaesthetic. Um, and on average in this hospital, we do somewhere between 800 and 1,000 a year. Um, Ms. Sweeney and I do you know, about the same elsewhere as well. Um, so we've, we've got a lot of practice. Now, in medicine, we, we grade varicose veins on a scale of one to six. Um, and this is basically a severity score. Um, and I'll just go through that because um, it helps to explain what veins need treatment for medical reasons and, and what might have treatment for cosmetic reasons. So grade one, uh, you can see in this picture here, are um, cosmetic thread veins, sometimes called spider veins or reticular veins. And these are very common indeed, particularly in women. Women get them much more than men uh, because they're affected by the um, female hormones effect on the skin. Uh, these are of cosmetic significance only. They don't make um, people unwell or give you any symptoms of aching, throbbing, swelling and so on. And you don't get skin damage with this type of vein. And they can either be safely left alone or if patients don't like the look of them because they're cosmetically unappealing, they can be treated with a technique called injection sclerotherapy, where we insert a very tiny needle into a very tiny vein and inject a chemical in which um, irritates the vein and makes it uh, seal uh, and eventually disappear. Um, it does take quite a long time for these veins to go away, even when they've been injected. You can expect to have bruising for a good six to eight weeks and sometimes longer than that. But that's a very easy thing to do. We do it in clinic um, and the number of sessions that people require for this sort of thing depends on how many veins they have and on what they want the legs to look like at the end of the treatment. So these are grade two veins. Again, these are very minimally important to the medical 
side of things. They sometimes cause a little bit of, it, of, of, of aching, but not terrible symptoms. And these can also be treated with sclerotherapy or occasionally they can just be physically removed uh, to get rid of them. That's a very easy and straightforward thing to do. Now, grade three veins are the commonest um, type of what, what I would call proper varicose veins. Around about 50% of patients with varicose veins will have grade three varicose veins. And this is a typical picture here. You can see the prominent twisty bulgy veins on the surface of the skin. What you can't see on this picture is the important bit, <clears throat> which is the bit inside the leg where the leaky pipe is that is actually filling the veins in the picture. And the relevance of that is that if one was just to take this patient to theatre and physically remove the veins that you can see in the photograph, it won't help at all. Because without fixing the underlying problem, the veins on the surface will just come back straight away. Um, and the only way of getting on top of this uh, is to fix the leak inside the leg. Um, patients can alternatively, if they choose not to have surgery, can control these sort of veins by using a compression stocking. But I've never met anybody that found that a congenial thing to do on a long-term basis. Um, so really compression stockings are only advisable for patients who can't have surgery for various other medical reasons or in whom we think surgery would be quite risky, again, for other medical reasons. Grade four veins are veins that are starting to damage the skin. Um, and you can see here in this photograph, there's a sort of slight uh, um, discontinuity, a roughness of the skin surface. Um, you get this thing called venous eczema, which is a very itchy uh, patch of skin. Sometimes there's a darkening of the skin, which is called hemosiderin deposition. And occasionally patients can have a condition called superficial phlebitis, where the veins become lumpy and hard. And that's not a deep vein thrombosis. That's a totally different thing. But, but phlebitis is annoying and it, and it will com continue to recur if the veins aren't attended to. And that's a grade four vein. Grades five and six are the uh, most serious. And this is the sort of end of the road, really, and, and ideally would never happen. So on the left hand side, you can see grade five, you've got very dark um, skin staining around the ankle with an area of rough skin. And on, on the right hand side, there's a horrible picture of a venous ulcer. Um, you don't need much imagination to um, work out that you really don't want to be uh, like the picture on the right hand side of the screen. We can heal venous ulcers, but it takes a lot of intensive treatment with compression bandaging and various other adjuncts uh, to get them to heal. Usually takes about three to four months to get them to heal. They're extremely painful, very debilitating. Um, and most of them are entirely preventable um, by um, prior surgery um, to veins before they get to this stage. So moving on to the bit inside the leg, the bit you can't see with the naked eye, um, there, there's a what we call a trunk vein. It's usually a vein called the saphenous vein. And there are two main trunk veins, saphenous veins in the leg, one running down the inside of the thigh, which is called the long saphenous vein or the greater saphenous vein. And there's another one running down the back of the calf from the knee crease down to the ankle, uh, down the back of the calf called the short saphenous vein or the lesser saphenous vein. Now, you can't see these veins with the naked eye. You need an ultrasound scan, um, uh, which we do in clinic uh, when we see patients. And um, if we can detect uh, what we call reflux or backwards flow, or in common language, leaky, leaky vein, um, in either of those two territories, we can then seal it using the laser. And the picture on the left-hand side shows the laser um, having been inserted into the blue vein just above the knee and passed all the way up to the top. And in this particular picture, uh, we've turned the laser on and slowly withdrawn it down the thigh, sealing the vein as you go. And in this particular picture, the 
the tip of the laser is now in the mid thigh section uh, and there's a little circle around it and you can see a white dot and that's the laser working and we slowly draw it down the leg um, to the entry point uh, and and seal the vein shut as as we go so that's endovenous um, laser treatment or endothermal ablation which is the same thing really um, and it seals the leaky vein using a heat-based technique. So that's EVLT. That's what we use. We've been using that. I mean, I've used all the techniques over the 20 years of plus I've been doing this. But um, the laser was the first minimally invasive technique to be developed. It was the first one I used. Um, I was the, the um, second surgeon in the UK to use it. The first surgeon was a chap called Mike Goff in Leeds. Um, I used it um, in 2002. Uh, and I'm still using it. Um, I still think it's the best option. Um, there are some other options. Uh, the most, the other common option is a thing called radio frequency ablation, which you will sometimes see in the literature or on Google searches, uh, sometimes called venous closure. And, and that's also a heat-based technique. In layman's terms, it's virtually identical to lasering. Um, there are some technical differences about it, which is why I still prefer the laser but um, it seals the vein by generating heat. The difference is that it generates heat using electricity rather than amplified light, which is what a laser is. And then there are a number of chemical techniques. Uh, sclerotherapy I've already mentioned, you can use it in a number of different ways. And um, some of my colleagues do use it on the bigger trunk veins. Um, I tend not to because uh, it has a couple of drawbacks. One is that it makes patients quite sore for about six weeks after treatment, whereas with the laser, most people will get better within a fortnight. And it also tends to have prolonged bruising. It does have its place in certain circumstances where the laser isn't uh, technically feasible, but um, but it, it's it's really for the smaller veins rather than for big ones. Clarivain um, is, a, is a, a hybrid technique using um, sclerotherapy and a mechanical uh, device to rough the vein up. And I was the first surgeon in the UK to use Clarivane um, in 2010. And in certain cases, it can work quite well, but I, and, it, and it's, it's relatively well tolerated. It's very, um, it, it doesn't hurt much for most people. Um, but I stopped using it because I, um, I thought it had a higher, or I found it had a higher rate of recurrence uh, than the laser. And, I, and that's why I um, still favor the laser. I was quite intrigued to see uh, just this last week in, in one of our um, scientific publications about vein surgery. One of my colleagues, a, a chap called Dan Caradice in Hull, has just done a big randomized controlled trial, which um, uh, shows exactly the same thing that I found um, 13 years ago, <laughs> which is why I stopped using Clarivain. But um, it's uh, nice to have one's prejudices confirmed. Um, and then finally, um, some there is still uh, some people that use glue, tissue glue, uh, to treat varicose veins. It's a it's an, in, in, it's a cyanoacrylate glue. It's not that different from super glue, really. Um, and uh, that that is also <coughs> used by some people for veins. But um, I've never been keen on it because it's very expensive, and uh, there have been a number of cases where that operation has gone spectacularly wrong and um, led to severe complications, skin breakdown and stuff like that. It, it hasn't happened commonly, but um, it's happened um, sufficiently frequently for me to know about it and, um, and to avoid it really. So, uh, so those are the, broadly speaking, those are the available techniques. Now, before um, we get anywhere near an operating theater, uh, one needs to, have a look at the patient in some detail um, to take a history of, of, of what has gone on before um, and to most importantly scan um, the, the leg. Uh, now Mr Sweeney, my colleague and I here, we do all our own scans uh, and I think that's very important. A lot of surgeons still don't use their own ultrasound, they send patients off for scanning somewhere else and whilst there are a small number of patients who, who, who for technical reasons, we need to send off for scans on a bigger machine in the x-ray department. Uh, we can scan 90% plus of people perfectly adequately um, in clinic with our mobile 
ultrasounds. And, and I think um, that really is the key uh, to being a decent venous surgeon. You have to be able to scan uh, to a good standard yourself. I don't, I don't think surgeons who haven't bothered to learn how to use ultrasound will ever really achieve um, technical proficiency in these techniques. So once we've examined the patient and scanned the patient, we're then able to be able to um, comb down on the on what the treatment um, options are, what what technically is feasible, and um, what the pros and cons of each um, of each approach would be, including no operation. Um, and I think it's important to stress that that no operation is sometimes the best option um, for all sorts of reasons. Um, sometimes because of technical difficulties, sometimes because of risk, because there's always risk in any procedure, um, no matter uh, how, how good an operation is, it always carries a risk tariff. And um, uh, so all of that stuff needs to be taken into consideration. Um, but once we've made a plan and the patients either decided what they want to do, they, some, a lot of patients come to clinic already having decided that they want to have surgery. Some people haven't really considered it in any depth and they like to go away and think about it and then let us know later on. Um, but we can usually book patients in within a few weeks. Um, and the vast majority of our um, surgery, as I say, is local anesthetic. And it's, you know, what we call walk in, walk out. Most procedures under local take around about 20 to 30 minutes. We put a bandage on and then the patient's able to go home. Can't drive a car for a few days, but uh, for most people, by the end of the first week, they're back to normal household activities. And by the end of the second week, they're back to light sports. Um, and this is um, a sort of photograph of, of how normally things progress. Bear in mind, and I'm, I'm saying this, you know, just to warn you, nobody ever shows a bad photograph in a, in a lecture or on a website. So this is a patient I treated this a long time ago. In fact, this patient was actually a medical photographer at Lewisham Hospital. So um, it was quite convenient. She was able to get her colleagues to take the photographs for us. And on the left hand side, you see the veins in the calf before surgery. On the right hand side, you see the veins two weeks after the operation. They've already shrunk. I didn't take any out. I just sealed the vein in the thigh with the laser. Um, and within two weeks, the veins had already gone down substantially and decompressed um, markedly. And by six weeks, they'd vanished um, without any further treatment. Now, it's not always as good as that. Sometimes we do we take the, take the veins out or we subsequently inject them. But that's a, as a, you know, as a rough guide. That's, that's how things progress um, after EVLT. And this is a patient of mine. Um, from a few years ago, kindly did a video um, to sort of explain um, all the stuff that I've just been talking about. It just lasts about four minutes, I think. My name is Jo Crossy. I'm 58 years old. Well, it did, it was making my legs more uncomfortable as the years went on, feeling very heavy and tired. Um, especially in the hot weather, um, my feet would um, swell um, and just generally feeling achy most of the time. Um, I did start working part time and part of that reason was probably unconsciously thinking actually I, I can't keep on my feet all day long every day. We thought it was worth the, um, the drive to go. Um, and especially when it was um, a beautifully new hospital, um, it was it was a very pleasant experience, um, and I wouldn't hesitate to go back again if I needed to in the future. My GP referred me on the 22nd of January, and I had my consultation with Benenden on the 31st of January, so I was quite impressed by that. The operation was very straightforward. You are given a booklet to explain um, what the procedure is. Um, Mr Challenger, who I saw also talked me through it but obviously when you're in consultation it's a lot of information to take in. 
So I came home and, and read the leaflet. I also looked um, online for him and he did a very good explanation online. Everything that was in the booklet is exactly what happened on the day you were talked through it and the staff were very um, helpful, supportive and, and talked you through every process. I felt as if I'm um, walking into a lovely environment like that, that um, everything was going to be okay, that it would be state-of-the-art um, technology and processes, so I felt very confident that um, I was in good hands. My recovery was, again, like it said on the tin, you know, I had to wear my bandages for five days and then take those off. I couldn't drive for five days, obviously, because they say for insurance purposes. If I had to stop quickly and I, or if I was in an accident, insurance might not um, be so happy if I was wearing bandages. And then I was back to work in a week. Um, it was a bit achy and a bit sore, but they give you advice about putting your feet up whenever you can, putting in local anaesthetics, uh, sorry, rubbing in local um, anaesthetic gels, wearing a support bandage if I needed to. And I did that a few times because the weather was quite warm um, post-surgery, um, so I, I made use of, of those um, devices and advice and it certainly helped. My life now has changed in that I, I'm not feeling the, the, the heaviness in my legs um, and I have been wearing shorts out and about, which I hadn't done before, so it certainly boosted my confidence in terms of that um, and yes getting back to running after two grandchildren. If anybody was thinking about having their varicose veins done I would recommend the Benenden Hospital. Their technology and, and the processes they do is it's, um, it's just a laser treatment is the way forward um, in terms of not making you lie in a bed, getting you up and getting you mobile. Um, certainly Benenden Hospital is uh, highly recommended as far as I'm concerned. Okay, um, so I think that uh, completes um, the uh, formal bit of the talk. Uh, I'm now going to hand back to Vicky, um, who will um, moderate the questions. We'll, we'll take a few questions. Um, if anyone's got any, of course. <laughs> Thank Over you. you uh, th thanks, <laughs> thanks, Mr. Chandler, for that very interesting presentation. Um, so we now take some questions. So um, please don't be shy. So the uh, first attendee asks: Will varicose veins always lead to grade five and six if they're left? Uh, no, they won't. Fortunately, um, the vast majority of patients who have symptomatic veins are grade three. And as a, the statistics show that um, out of people with grade three veins, about only about um, a third of them will go on to develop serious skin change. And of those, only about half will go on to develop something which could become an ulcer. So it's a relatively small percentage. And the other important point, as I said before, is this process usually takes a very long time. It takes decades uh, to happen. And that indeed is the reason why the vast majority of people who end up with a venous ulcer are elderly. Nevertheless, um, if, if you do get an ulcer, that's really bad. Um, and it, it, for, for, for older patients who have venous ulcers, um, it effectively um, ends their uh, independence in, in certain circumstances because they can't go out, they have to have bandages on, the thing smells and weeps and it's just horrible. Um, and that really is the rationale for fixing it at an earlier stage. And certainly if you have signs of skin damage, then an operation is certainly something to consider it's not the only option but it's certainly worth considering um, to prevent progression once you start to get bad skin change you're pretty likely to get an ulcer if you don't have it fixed 
Okay, thank you. I hope that's provided some um, information reassurance to the question asker. Uh, so the next one is from Noel. Uh, Noel asks, is there an increased risk of blood clotting or other serious risks due to having varicose veins, for example, grade three and upwards? Yeah, so we've got complicated varicose veins, grade three veins, there's no increased risk of DVT. Um, in certain grade four veins, so when patients are getting recurrent bouts of phlebitis, there is a slightly increased risk of DVT. Not huge, but, but slightly increased. And in very, very bad phlebitis, where you get it up the trunk vein, which doesn't happen that often, but when it does, then that does increase the risk of DVT as well. So uh, the vast majority of people don't have increased risk, um, but there are some categories of vein that do. Um, there's also, paradoxically, of course, I mean, you, there are, there's a risk of DVT after vein surgery. Um, it doesn't happen often. <clears throat> it's around about one. People still argue about the, the, the risk of it. Um, a lot of people quote one in 200. I, I don't think it's that high in our practice. It's around about one in 500. Um, we give everybody anticoagulants in our practice, which might be why we've got a slightly lower incidence than the, than the quoted figures in the literature. Um, but yes, you, you can get a DVT after surgery um, if you're really unlucky. Okay, thank you. Um, next one is from Roz. Uh, Roz has got two questions, so we we'll just take one at a time. Um, so they say, you mentioned muscle cramps as possible symptoms of varicose veins, but didn't elaborate. Can you elaborate on why they happen and what you can do about them? Yeah, so they happen because the vein is stretched and the pressure in the vein is too high. When you measure that, when you scan somebody, you measure, I measure the diameter of the, vein, of the saphenous vein and a normal a long sphenous vein should have a diameter of about three to three and a half millimeters. But a varicose vein might be anywhere from four, five, six, even bigger. One of the um, patients I saw just this afternoon had a, had a, a 10 millimeter varicose vein, which is really quite swollen. And it's the pressure because of the swelling that is uncomfortable. Anything in the body which is um, pressurized or, or distended um, is uncomfortable. It doesn't matter whether it's a varicose vein or, you know, a, a pregnant uterus or a gallbladder, or it doesn't matter what it is. Anything that's swollen is uncomfortable. And that's why you get the discomfort. As far as treating it, other than mes mes mechanisms other than surgery, the best way of dealing with it without surgery is to wear a below knee compression stocking because that squeezes the vein flat um, and um, will reduce the swelling and attendant discomfort. But the downside is, of course, you have to wear the stocking and the stocking has to be firm because if it's not firm, it won't work. Um, and, uh, um, and so that's the, that's the downside of stockings. Um, but they do work and they work effectively if people wear them. Okay, thank you. And the second part of Rosie's question is, uh, is your handheld scanner a Doppler or is that only the big one in major hospital vascular departments? Um, a, do a Doppler, um, that depends what you mean by, uh, you might have a different understanding of the word Doppler than I do. So um, from a technical point of view, a Doppler is, is it's just an imaging technique. And um, my um, small scanner has a Doppler facility. I don't really need it that much. Actually, I can use the, um, uh, the, the color flow to pick up directional blood flow on it um, in just the same way as, as we do on the um, scanner in the, the big scanner in the x-ray department. Um, the advantage of the scans in the, in the x-ray department is that the big machines um, have greater uh, depth um, and you can look at the deep veins of the leg um, in a more comprehensive way than you can with a portable scanner. Uh, you can still image the deep veins with a portable scanner, but it's just, it's not as accurate. Um, but the vast majority of patients, you don't really need to, to do an extensive deep vein scan. Um, so the patients that need a scan in the, in the x-ray department are usually only patients where there's a past history of deep vein thrombosis. There's a clinical suspicion that there's a problem with the deep veins um, or the, the leg is so big that it's really difficult to image properly. Um, with with the with the uh, small machine, uh, so the vast majority of, of the stuff that we do is perfectly um, amenable to 
um, scanning with a small machine. Okay, that's great to hear, Ros. I hope that's answered um, your questions. Uh, next one is from Rachel. Uh, Rachel asks, if you have pelvic varicous veins, is there any point in treating veins in the leg? Yeah, that's a very good question. And um, that and the answer is it, it kind of depends on how bad they are. Um, around about a third of women who've had uh, pregnancies will have some form of pelvic vein reflux. Most of them won't even be aware of it. Um, but sometimes the pelvic vein reflux will manifest itself by varicose veins in the leg. And if those veins are large, then um, there's little point really in treating them just in the leg because they always come back or very often come back extremely quickly. And so for the patients with, with large pelvic varicosities draining into the leg, um, my preferred uh, method of treating them is to um, send them for a pelvic vein embolization, which is a long word, but and it sounds a bit scary, but it's not really. Um, but it is very technically demanding. Um, and, and that's a, a technique where um, a radiologist will uh, insert a, a catheter, a very fine tube, into the leaking vein in the middle of the pelvis and seal it from within. There aren't many radiologists who are good at this. Um, fortunately, I happen to know one of the best ones in the country, um, a guy called uh, Narayan Karanithi, who's a consultant radiologist at St. Thomas's. We've been working together for a, a very long time. We, we have, you know, he, he, he show, he, we, we have the same secretary. And so all of my patients with pelvic vein reflux um, will be referred to Narayan and, and he will do the pelvic vein embolization. And once that's been done, the patient will then come back to see me and I'll fix the veins in the leg. Um, and that's the most effective way of getting a durable result. That's great, thank you. Uh, next question is from Alison. Uh, Alison is 45 and she has four children. Uh, she says she has uh, veins in her right leg only due to pregnancy. She's a busy mum and runs every day for her mental health. How long uh, before she can run again? Uh, and initially after treatment, will she have to rest? Or can she be the busy mum that she is, if that makes sense? Um, and so, also, what's the chance that they come back? OK, so the, 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 as I said before, the, for most patients, just having straightforward EVLT, um, by the end of the first week after treatment, most people are back to their normal household activities. So driving a car, doing all that household chores stuff. Um, and most people are going back to work as long as their work isn't unduly onerous physically. Um, most patients will need to take tablets for two or three days, um, not much more than that. And by the end of the second week, most people are back to the gym or to light sports. Um, by the end of the third week, most people, they might still have a few lumps and bumps and be a bit bruised, but for all intents and purposes, most people have forgotten about it um, by that point. Um, and that's in comparison with when we did it the old way, where we used to put people to sleep and strip the veins out um, with a big plastic rod. Um, and most patients took about six weeks to get better from that. So um, there is a, a recovery period. It can be a bit sore, but for most people, by, by the um, the end of the second week, they're getting back to their normal exercise routine. As far as recurrence is concerned, there is a risk of recurrence. And for most patients, it's round about 5% at five years. So one in 20. Um, and again, one has to compare that with what went before. Uh, the, the high tide strip operation had a recurrence rate of 30% at five years. So EVLT is by no means perfect, but um, it's certainly a lot better in every um, domain than than the, what we used to do uh, when I was a young surgeon. Um, you know, the people get better faster, they have less pain, they've got lower rates of recurrence, and there are lower risks of other complications such as wound infections and nerve damage and, and stuff like that. Okay, great. Hopefully that's answered uh, your question. Um, got time for a couple more. Uh, so we've got a question from Ryan who asks, after EVLT surgery, how long might I need to wait before I can fly? Yeah, so lots of different views on this point. Um, 
it's all about the risk of deep vein thrombosis after flight. Um, when we're not, you know, we, 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 it's very difficult to pr produce any hard and fast statistical evidence on this because you just can't power up the studies statistically to make them relevant. But the majority of my colleagues, and certainly my view, is I recommend patients don't fly for four weeks after surgery. Um, the risk after four weeks after treatment is almost certainly the same as background, so as if you hadn't had an operation. Um, and I think that's probably, you know, that's that's a sort of consensus advice. Okay, great, thank you. Well, I know that's answered your question. Um, Moira asks, is there an age limit for someone who is otherwise healthy? I'm 75 with a prominent vein running down the front of my left leg from the kneecap. Uh, no, um, it's not so much, um, you know, how many miles you've got on the clock. It um, depends on the state of your engine, really. Um, and if you're otherwise fit and well, uh, no, I mean, we, we operate on, you know, everybody from 19 to 90 and older um, uh, on occasions. I mean, it, it depends really what, why you want, why you want to have an operation. I mean, uh, you know, whether it's symptoms or whether it's prevention of ulcers uh, or, or, or whether it's cosmetic. Um, for most older patients, um, it's a combination of symptoms and um, and prevention of um, deterioration and ulceration in later life. Those are the main drivers why people come for treatment. But it's one of the big advantages of EVLT and the shift to minimally invasive surgery, particularly under local anesthesia, that we can do operations on older patients who um, who might otherwise have been turned down for general anaesthetic um, in days gone by uh, because the risks of doing it under local are much lower. So, um, so we're able to treat um, older and more infirm patients uh, with, with good levels of safety and, uh, and good efficiency. So, yeah. Okay. Um, and we've got time for one more question. Um, this person asks, are there any issues if you're on blood thinners? Um, yes, a bit, um, but it's not necessarily uh, don't you, you know it's not necessarily the case that you can't have surgery because you're taking anticoagulants. There are lots of reasons why people take anticoagulants. Um, the commonest is a condition called atrial fibrillation, which is a, an, a, 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 an irregular heartbeat. And people are on anticoagulants in that circumstance to reduce the risk of stroke. Um, so for patients like that, we normally stop the anticoagulant for a couple of days beforehand, do the operation and then restart it afterwards. And that works pretty well. Um, there are some patients who are anti on anticoagulants for more serious issues, like for example, they've had multiple DVTs or they've got mechanical heart valves, um, which, you, and you can't stop the anticoagulation in those patients. And for those sorts of patients, um, You've really got to think carefully about whether or not surgery is the best option um, or whether um, treatment with with compression is better. Um, but on, you know, I, I have treated many patients uh, who needed to remain on their anticoagulants um, for various medical reasons. Um, and on balance, we considered that surgery was the best option. And I've treated patients uh, very successfully with them um, with EVLT while they were still taking anticoagulants. You do get more bruising, um, fairly obviously you would, um, and it might take a bit longer for them, that, those sort of patients to get better. But in the right circumstances, if, if it's necessary, you can do it without stopping the anticoagulants if you have to. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. China. Um, so that's all the time we've got for questions. Um, sorry if we didn't get to answer yours, but if you provided your name, uh, we'll get back in touch with you via email. Um, if you'd like to discuss uh, varicose vein treatment or book your consultation, Chelsea from our private patient team um, can take your call this evening until 8pm or between 8am and 6pm Monday to Friday using the number on the screen. Uh, you can also now book your appointment uh, directly on our website. We're offering a discount for joining this session. Uh, that's valid for seven days with the terms displayed. You'll uh, receive a short survey um, and we'd be very grateful if you could spare a few minutes to let us have your feedback. 
Our next webinars include gynaecology and knee replacement surgery, and you can visit our website uh, to sign up for those. So on behalf of Mr. Challoner um, and our expert team at Bellenden Hospital, I'd like to say thank you ever so much for joining us today, and we hope to hear from you very soon. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>